It's it a sounds, like a vacuum. sounds like a vacuum cleaner. I was thinking like a printer or something. I don't know, it's, it sounds more consistent than a printer. Because with printers, like, you, you'd have more... Thanks for that, Matt. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> if you would like to know, know more about things using only sound effects, the sound effects, please contact me. <laughs> there can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello. Welcome to Cinema Royale. This is our last episode of January. Today is January 25th, 2015. I'm your host, Mike. And let me introduce to you to my awesome film aficionados. James is going to be late, so I'll introduce him or say hello to him when he comes in, but let's introduce the others. First off, we've got Matt, also known as Animat. Salutations, fellow viewers, and welcome to this wonderful podcast. I hope you will be educated and well entertained about our subject in specific movies that we will be talking about today. Woo. Woo. Hold on a sec, folks. We Hold just got a kawinky dink. Breaking news, everybody. Just give me a second. Now he turns up. Hey, he turned up at the perfect time. It is. I started at the right time. Aw. Now the podcast is ruined. It's ruined. You put up with loser over here. <laughs> You're gonna be free of him for a week. It's a, you know, the funny thing is, is that, it, like, from the position of where you are, it looks like you're pointing at nothing. It's like you're pointing at my sidebar. Honestly, that's... What's was, over here? What's over here? No, no, no. That's James. That, that, no, on my side, it was perfect, actually. Really? It okay, worked. well, your okay, you, well, yours is the most important one, so it yeah, works. It James, we were just talking about you. And with James! You. You're just in time for the introduction, and you just missed my imp impression of what, of the subject of this uh, podcast. Dang. Yeah, that. <laughs> but you know, James, it is never too late to hear it. There is always time to hear my impersonations. Hello, Mr. Hurt. And salutations to you, Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> Are we whimsing it up this evening? I, I guess so. Uh, At least I am. Speaking of the devil, let me introduce Mr. James Jaime to Sullivan here. Oh, we're recording, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're on live. Okay. It's a glow you got there, James. <laughs> Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Don't Worry About a Thing. Shut up, James. Ah! Yes. Little thing, it's Shut gonna up. be all right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yet, <laughs> no, don't worry about a thing. Maybe it's just my hair. Yeah, that was more That's how I know, but I know one thing. I love you. How do you like my pajamas? They're terrible. I don't know. I can really see them. They're terrible. And last but not least, Jada Jada. Jada, say hi. Uh, what? Um, hi. I'm a tired Jada Gonzalez, who still wants to see Strange Magic despite the really bad views it's got because I'm loyal to Alan Cumming and George Lucas. No. No, you don't. Yes, no. I do, Matt. <laughs> no, you don't. Look, I don't care if the movie has a lot of singing in it or if the singing is jukebox. That doesn't it's bother not me. The it's not that. It's not that. Trust me. Like, I like jukebox musicals. I like Moulin Rouge. I like Happy Feet, but this one, oh my god. <laughs> no. Why, why do I care what you think? You hate Claudia the Chancellor's balls. <laughs> You're lost. Your opinion <laughs> does not affect me. I, I try to warn you, but... Look, there's no way in hell I've, I haven't seen worse Alan Cumming movies, okay? I have seen the worst that Alan Cumming can give me. I'm, I'm good. You've seen Son of the Mask? Oh, okay. Well, she's right then. Um, 
And I've seen Flintstones in Beaver Rock, Vegas. So if you're going to tell me that Strange Magic is worse than that, which you're not. I'm going to have to side with Matt here still because I, I, I'm I, just not interested, really. Wait, did you see the film? Anyways. Huh? Wait, did you see Strange Magic? Did I? No, no. Good. Thank you. I just did that to tease you. Come on. Okay. Yeah. But still, okay. Because we like to tease. Because <laughs> we that... like to tease on the podcast. Oh my god. You know, I was just listening to the soundtrack to that movie while I was waiting for you guys because somebody finally managed to post it on YouTube. Lord knows how long that'll last, but listening to Alan Cummins singing his rock songs. I've been mistreated. Speak, speak of the if you want a good. If you want a good Alan Cumming musical, watch Reefer Madness. I've seen Reefer Madness, and I've seen Cabaret, and I've seen a whole bunch of good Alan Cumming musicals. Annie, you know. Oh, yeah, they're... Well, that was okay. Anyway. There's no denying Alan Cumming is great, but that's not who we're here for today. No, we are... We are celebrating... The belated birthday of John Hurt, who turned 75 last Thursday. Um, he is a legendary actor. He's not a main role actor, per se. He's, he's more like a supporting actor. And he's very legendary in our hearts, because, my lord, he's been in so many great stuff. Um, so, we are going to start off as quickly as possible. To Jada, who is going to talk about a film known as Hellboy. Yes. Boy of the Hell. I completely forgot that he was even in that. He plays a pretty significant character. Like, semi-significant. He's like one of those roles that you give to veteran actors in blockbuster movies to, like, up the hype for the highbrow views. You know, not totally insignificant, but not exactly a star, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, he, he, he just got it because, well, like, he's a name and he's old, so might as well. Yeah, and he, you know, his character is like this kind of wise mentor sort of thing, like kind of a father figure to Hellboy, kind of like a, a Nick Fury to the little alien slash superpowered X-Men girl stuff that they got going on in their secret society run by the dude by arrest, from Arrested Development and stuff. Wait, are you talking about... Wait, Jer- uh, yeah, Jeffrey Chamber? I don't know. I just know him as the guy from Arrested Development and a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't know his name. I know Michael Sarah and Jason Bateman. That's it. I think I heard the name of the guy who was in Alvin the Chipmunks once, but... Yeah, yeah, it's Jeffrey Chamber. You're talking about King Neptune in Spongebob movie, so okay. Okay, so <laughs> that makes you an expert. That's what it takes. I is smart. Okay, I is smart. Yay! Yes, Jeffrey Camber. 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 Probably the third most successful actor who was in Arrested Development and then got a career afterwards. And the most successful actor to ever uh, kiss a dog's butt on screen. Oh, no. That's There's so few of those. It's <laughs> dying art. It's... Mm-hmm. Gotta no give him problem. credit. <laughs> Again, though, not his worst movie. No, no. True. Anyway, Hellboy is yes. what we're talking about. It's a comic book movie based on comics. A and comic book movie based on comics. Oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the Image Comics. That's it. Image Comics. Right? Dark Horse. <clears throat> Dark Horse. I'm sorry. There's a lot of comic companies out there that I don't uh, give a shit about because uh, they're not purple. They're DC. Exactly. They're not purple? Is that what you said? Um, Marvel, you strange. Oh, Marvel. Shh. I heard purple. <laughs> yeah, I thought Hellboy was red. Um. <laughs> Let me see DC's logo. That's blue. Screw that. Anyway, again, Mr. Brunette here. It's 
one of my personal favorite superhero movies, as well as one of my favorite Guillermo del Toro movies. Although I still haven't seen Pan Labyrinth. I really should get on that. Mm. I like, it. I like oh, yeah. it because it has like the makings and the background of what would be a really dark and really gritty sort of Sin City Spawn-esque story, but it ends up being really lighthearted and funny in its tone. And, like, when I first heard of the movie and I first started watching it, I was expecting it to be, like, the Spawn-esque dark thing, you know? And then when it got all fun, I was like, hey, yeah, this is much better. <laughs> I feel like Von Roman excels at that, taking serious roles and making them charming and whimsical in a badass way. Yes. Mm-hmm. John Hurt does the job of the veteran actor who's supposed to make a blockbuster movie more appealing to a high-brow crowd. He, you know, classes it up a bit. He, he plays a serious contrast to the goofy shit that's going on. And, mm -hmm. then, and then he uh, dies halfway through the movie. And that's not a spoiler because he's a wise mentor and wise mentors die. That's what they do. He's you know? the one that yeah. discovers Hellboy, right? Yeah. Him and a bunch ah. of other people are like in his group that are fighting Nazis. And they discover him like as part of this satanic ritual that some Nazis did because, you know, they're Nazis. They were probably minions of the devil. Why not? Like you do. And and John Hurt kind of like goes all Claude Frollo from the Hunchback of Notre Dame book, only before he got all creepy and was like, I will take this deformed child in. <laughs> Nobody else will. You'd have to read Aww. it. That'd be funny. If you saw kinda, the movie, you'd yeah. out a lot. It kind of makes me think like, like John Hurt plays the role of uh, Judge Frollo, just singing like Bells of Notre Dame just there. No, just so he can walk away where no one else could see. No, the I'm not talking about the damn Disney movie, Matt. Oh. That was so my good. Stupid though. screen. Am I pointing at you yet? Mike, that's Mike. You're the judge. It's to your, it's to your right. Yep. There. Okay. John Hurt's character also makes a brief cameo in the beginning of the second movie in which he tells young little kid Hellboy the story about the golden beetles and shit that ended up being the bad guy for the rest of the film. You know, sort of a setup thing. But, you know, he, he plays a good enough character that you're sort of sad when he dies and you like seeing him when you see him. He's not the, he's by no means the highlight of the movie. Even though IMDb will tell you that it's one of his most well-known roles because, you know, IMDb sucks. It's IMDb. They're not usually the best when it comes to... Like, you're, they're, they're pretty much the Google of movies. You're, you're just there to find out information. Mm -hmm. That's it. Exactly. It's kind of like a less reliable, less broad Wikipedia. Yeah, because you, yeah. you don't go on IMDb More for ratings, that's actually. for damn sure. I think when they when they list off the the four mo top movies that that uh, the actor or whoever it is has been in with uh, uh, with the IMDb, usually they list off the ones that were the most successful or notable, not necessarily the ones that the actor in in particular is known for. No, 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 no. No, uh, no I think it's more like the most what, like. They list off the four most popular movies that uh, this person is in. Like, what's really popular on IMDb? Like, that's how they rate it. Although in June, in that's pretty much the same thing as uh, what I'm saying. I guess. <laughs> it's not like it's my turn or anything. Okay, no. Jada, Jada. Continue. I was just, just going to say, in the interest of fairness to IMDb, at least they base their ratings on what the people think, you know? Like, everybody can vote, as opposed to Rotten Tomatoes, which just relies on the opinions of a bunch of stuffy old critics who suck. Right. Right. You know, it's like, Rotten Tomatoes is the Oscars, and I guess IMDb is the People's Choice Awards. Exactly. I would, and they actually, get just I as much say, shit wrong. Actually, I would say more Metacritic is the Oscars. Um... Go, um Rotten Tomatoes is the Golden Globes, and then there's IMDb that's pretty much like the MTV Movie Awards. No, they're not the MTV Movie Awards. They're more broad than that, more sophisticated than that. For the rating system? 
<laughs> they do everything, you know, Off for the performances, <laughs> for the, the guests that they get, for, for for the flashiness and the technology, and for the, the ratings and the... Okay, for, for like the presentation and stuff like that. Okay, well, maybe... People's Choice uh, Awards. That it, it's, it's not nearly as classy as Rotten Tomatoes or, I guess, Metacritic, but it, at least it's more fair. At least it, you know, probably acknowledges the existence of Selma. The thing that Rotten Tomatoes is is nice about is... I'd, I'm going to be honest, I, I really do think they handpick these... Uh, uh, these uh, ratings for some of these films, but uh, it it balances that out between it balances out between what the critics think and what the audiences think. What does that make the Razzies? I honestly don't know. Like at at this point, the Razzies, I think they're kind of like People's Choice Awards because they still let audiences uh, choose like who's the winner and stuff like that so no, they just assume like, they, they know have... the audience would choose as the winner well, I, I don't know, know. Like, what's a really what? really crappy movie website that we can just stick to ra- the Razzies like a um, channel awesome <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> I wanted to go in the safe zone with PME, but you had to go there. (laughs) Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, you can't unsay it. You said it. Now live with it. Well, well, they do review bad movies. That's, uh, well, some of the time. But anyway. Yeah. It's done, James. It's done. You said it. I heard you, Doug. (laughs) I love you too, Doug. <laughs> Doug is everyone's every every internet reviewer's waifu. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about now? I don't know. What I'm just silent. What is this? What, are we going, going to the next movie now or something? Like, there's like nothing going on with John Hurt here. What the hell? Well, we already. Yeah, I just hope that my neighbor. <laughs> there's John our Hurt. topic. <laughs> It's hard to talk about John Hurt with Hellboy. I'm not gonna lie. I, I feel like it's covered all the bases with him. He's the wise mentor. He's there for the highbrow viewers. He dies. Yeah, like it is true. I mean, like it is. the fact that, like, if we if we want to talk about John Hurt and like we bring up Hellboy, like he's barely a cameo. So, like, what else can we really talk about? Well, I guess well, it's significant yeah. that it gave him a more mainstream audience. Like, more people are aware of him now that Hellboy happened. You know, it's not just British people and really artsy folks and people who watch the, the animated Lord of the Rings. It's not just them. Yeah, you could also mention how it, how with with Hellboy, it's it's less about John Hurt and how how uh, much more amazing it is that um, Ron Perlman is 55 years old playing a character who's uh, who's supposed to be physically speaking 28 okay. yeah. sure. I'm sorry James I didn't catch that what was that I said the amazing thing about Hellboy is that it's not John Hurt so much but also the fact that Ron, Ron Perlman is uh, was about 55 years old when he made that and uh, his character is physically speaking supposed to be about 28 in the film yeah, but he doesn't look old, you know, because the makeup, the makeup in that movie exactly. is phenomenal. Exactly. With him and with oh, yeah. Sapien especially. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, and also the fact that John Hurt, no, not John Hurt, I mean, um, Ron Perlman, pretty much his face is the, it's, it's like the perfect structure, like, that copies the one designed by, uh, I believe Mike Mignola is the original Hellboy creator, like, of Ron the comics. Perlman. Mike McNola, yes. Ron Perlman was straight up a perfect Hellboy. Like, there's there's mm-hmm. no getting around it. I, I can't imagine anyone else in the role. You know, he's just Ron. one of those casting decisions that's just... It could not possibly have been any better. Like, Mike... No, my, like, no not Mike Mc, Like, Ron Perlman is Hellboy. Like, you can assure there's not going to be a Hellboy remake because you can't do it without Ron, Ron Perlman. Exactly. 
Well, if they did do a Hellboy remake, Ron Perlman would probably want to be a part of it. He's still mad that he didn't get a third movie. He's still pissed about that. Well, I don't know. I'm on his IMDb page, and apparently it says announced. I don't know. Again, IMDb. They suck. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, we just talked and about that. Hellboy, has been on I- Hellboy 3 has been on IMDb for, like, almost a decade now. Yeah, you true. Know? Yep, exactly. They, they just want it to exist. All right, let's just hop along to the next film, which Anime would like to t- discuss, which would be yeah. the Black Cauldron. Yes, the Black Cauldron. Really, um, this was t- uh, Disney's 25th animated feature, released in 1985. Which, it's pretty much the first animated feature that the new batch of animators. Um, can pretty much uh, work on their own movie now that all the all the old animators that used to work with Walt Disney has pretty much retired. However, nowadays it is considered the black sheep of Disney, but not because it was bad or anything. It's mostly because it was a major box office bomb, so much so that um, that it made less money than the Care Bears movie. It, it was As pretty much that. Will bad. Never let you forget now. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, like it, it, it's kind of like one of those signs where like it is that bad. But anyways, for the Black Cauldron itself, I will say that I'm I wouldn't say it like it's definitely not Disney's best, but it's like it's not really that bad either. No. Like, it's a bit of a pass, I would say, because well First of all, I just want to mention that one of the biggest problems with the movie is pretty much many of the characters are really not, like, the main characters are really not that interesting. First, you got, um, you got Tarin, who's really, like, he's pretty much shown as a wimp. Like, he wants to be this warrior, but, like, he really, like, he doesn't really do much. And then you got Elon Wee, who's the princess. Like, she wants to do, like, she wants to be more than just a princess, but, like, she doesn't do anything either. And then you got Fluterflam. He's just the comic relief. And then you got Gurgi, who's pretty much, like, the cute comic relief. So, like, they're all... They're Gurgi! Much... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, our character has problems. Problems. <laughs> he's pretty He's like... like a mix of a... Gurgi's a mix of a Wookiee and Stitch, pretty much. I always thought of him as a mix like between, like, a Care Bear had a baby with Gollum. That's always what I pictured Gurgi to be. Yeah. The abomination result of. Yeah. But um, the one thing I will say, but then we got John Hurt who plays the Horned King. And I, I gotta say that out of all the Disney villains out there, he, uh, the Horned King is one of the most underrated Disney villains, mostly because of the fact that he's in this movie. He is one of the more, like, he's pretty much one of the more menacing and like one of the well i guess scarier but more menacing and powerful disney villains like right up there with like maleficent and stuff like that the horn king pretty much he has this pre like this inner like this presence where like when he's there like everybody stops there it's like no no laughing matter you got to do what he, he says or you're pretty much screwed and like Especially with the with the dark baritone that John Hurt provided, it's like it really is um, really dark, like really dark and really brooding. It's like it gives out such a powerful performance, and it really, really is incredible. And like and like I said, he truly is such an underrated villain. And honestly, for my recommendation. Like, for any Disney or animation fans, I highly, highly encourage you that you watch The Black Cauldron at least once. Because also, like, another good thing is that, well, the at least the animation is really good. I mean, it is from Disney. And that, um, also, some of the emotional aspects is kind of still there. Like, sure, the characters are not are really not great. They're, they're some of the most forgettable Disney characters you can find, but, like, you could still feel a bit for them. There's still the emotional aspect. But yeah, like I said, um, for any Disney or animation fan, I highly encourage you to watch The Black Cauldron at least once. Where, like, if you like it, good. If not, at least you could say you can watch it. And now well, you guys can have. I, 
I, I like the Black Cauldron for, for what it is. I feel like it gets a more flack than it does because it's from Disney, you know? Kind of like most of Disney's lesser films. From another company, they'd be mm-hmm. viewed as a lot more passable, but from Disney, there's like a higher standard, you know? And this was like, just, this was one of the films where Disney like tried to do something different and they sort of didn't really know how because they're so used to their own formula. So it was just kind of sort of half-assedly glossing over the elements of that particular dark epic fantasy genre they were familiar with. As for the Horned King, well, for one thing, I don't think he's the most underrated Disney villain ever because Professor Radigan exists. Well, Radigan is more popular. Radigan is pretty much it. He's got a more of a cult following, I'll grant you that, but if you ask, like, your average Disney watching Joe, like, any person that you'll see at Walt Disney World, who's Professor Radigan? They'll probably be like, uh... The world's greatest criminal mind! <laughs> Quite frankly, he, he, he's probably the best thing about the movie. That's not saying much. I don't think he's really groundbreakingly good. He's kind of like this generic, I'm a big dark force and I'm just gonna use this cauldron to destroy everything and I've got a big dark voice he kind of struck me as like a more grown up version of No Heart from Care Bears again with the comparisons to Care Bears it's kind of weird isn't it like you got a little Care Bear Gollum thing you got a Care Bear villain you got a Care Bear movie that you out in the box office except this you can't dark- really except you can't really see the Horn King just go out going time for a god time for a game of disappearing bears well, that wasn't No Heart, that was Dark Heart. So check yourself, Mr. Animation Expert. Ooh. Yeah, but it's Care Bears. I mean, like... <laughs> well, the, know, I mean, the two Hurt, villains yeah. weren't all that different. Come on. John, John Hurt, he, he, he was a... He, he, he provided a good voice for it, and he probably made the villain less generic. But not, like, a lot less generic. Honestly, the most memorable thing about him, for me, at least as a kid, was the way he died. Which was like, he was like dragged into the cauldron as the cauldron like claimed him as his curse and he was like ripped into skeleton pieces. And my like 10 year old self was just like, ah! That was a freaking intense death scene, man. Like that was up there. Yeah, like, true. It was probably more intense than the Lion King. More intense than, mm. I don't know, a bug life? What are some I'd really say animals? so. Oh, it's like, it's like, it's pretty much like the death in the li- uh, like Scar's death in the Lion King, except you see what happens. I kind of compare it more to like Doctor Facilier's death in Prince and the Frog, with you know the whole dragged into hell thing. Oh but yeah. Horn- sure. But with the Horn King, it's a lot more violent. You know, and a lot less colorful. Something like that. I. Uh... Oh, I like. Wait, one more thing. I like the little green sidekick that he has. You know. Oh he's yeah. Kind of- he was kind of like, in another comparison between the Horned King and No Heart, he was kind of like Beastly. You know, No Heart's little sidekick with the helmet yeah. hat. I watched Care Bears as a kid, don't look at me. Oh yeah, I know who So did I. I. So did I. I, uh... So do I get to, get to have a piece on this? Sure. Okay. Well, um... Spoiler alert, uh, there will be no, uh, there will be no, uh, from pages to pictures, the Black Cauldron. At least, uh, not in the immediate future. However, I can say this much. I have read the book. And... That's a perspective. Yeah, that... Well, here, if you, uh, the book, the Black Cauldron is the second book in the Chronicles of Praedane book series, which was written back in the 60s. And uh, the reason why I I look back and say I I should have uh, maybe started with the first book is because the film actually incorporates elements from both stories. Uh, Mainly, if if you just start reading The Black Cauldron like I did, um... There is no Horned King. Actually, the Horned King was the villain in the first book. So he doesn't have so, a black cauldron. Um, no, he does not. He does not have the black cauldron. It's uh, it, it's some other 
throwaway villain. Uh, I actually heard that, like he he has more of a minor role actually, like not not even a main villain. It's like I heard he he only has like a minor role in the Predane series. Mm, he's just in the first book. That's it. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, there there is that. But the the rest of the story, it's confusing because. Um, reading the book, you just sort of. At reading the second book, I just sort of stepped in into the middle of something that was much bigger, and uh, wasn't. Uh, I. I kind of, I guess by the end of reading it, I I had so many more questions, but it was just, it was just an incomplete experience. Uh, but the other, the other most memorable uh, change that I can tell you right off the bat, um, in the in the film, in order to destroy the black cauldron, they how do you do it? Oh. Uh, um, I think like a sacrifice or something. Yeah, Gurgi jumps have, into it. Yes, Gurgi, uh, you have to have a willing person to sacrifice it. But here's the great thing about being me, is that I can be the guy who tells you what the Disney folks did was the Disney ending. Uh, yes, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Yep. With the fake death and everything. Uh, he goes I into the cauldron. This. He goes into the cauldron. The witches bring him back later. And, like uh... Too, basically. Lo, and, lo and behold, he's the... He's, he's back to life again. Um... In the book, don't worry, it's not, uh... It's not Gurgi that goes into the, the black cauldron. Oh, phew. I was so worried. <laughs> it's a guy... It's a guy named uh, Eladir. I think he's a, he's a prince. In, he's one of the good guys, but he's... He's always... Uh, he's very greedy. He's always uh, picking on Tauron throughout the story. And... In the end, he's the one who decides to go ahead and do the unselfish thing and make the sacrifice. Does he come okay, back? Think... No. I'll let you guys guess. Does he come back? No. Well, no. Because no. wait, are there go three witches? Win a prize. Are there, are there three hey. witches in the books? Are there three funny witches in the books, or at least three witches in general? Mm, maybe in the first book, but not in the second one. It was so. It was such a cop out too, because the witches were like, "No, we can't do that. That's physically impossible." And then the funny old guy was like, "You're just chicken," and they were like, oh, "I'll show you." And then they just brought him back. It was no problem at all. Somehow that actually powerful. reminds me of like Swords of Stone with Merlin and uh, Mad Madam Mim, like that kind of rivalry. It it, it seemed like. Them. Actually, I was thinking they were like the three fairies from Sleeping Beauty, only in reverse. You know, it's a it's the three mims. <laughs> like three mim, three mad madam mims. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. It's uh, it's the mix of the three fairies from the three good fairies from Sleeping Beauty, and somehow they're all mad madam mim. Mm-hmm. So. That's that, I guess, of the Black Cauldron. Have you seen it? You haven't said much on it, Mike. Nope. Haven't seen it. But but there is one oh. more thing I will add. Like, maybe it is... I, like, you could be right, Jada. Like, maybe there really isn't much in, written-wise in terms of the Horn King, but I definitely really do admire in the execution of the Horn King, like, both through the animation and by... Uh, uh, John uh, John Hurt himself, which is also why I put him, I think, at number six in my top ten scariest Disney moments. Like he really is, like, damn. <laughs> like he he definitely. It's like if there's any reason why you want to watch The Black Cauldron is because of Horn King. Here's yeah. something interesting I I noticed right off the bat with um, uh, I think the first time I watched The Black Cauldron. 
Did you guys, uh, did you guys recognize, uh, when they, when they first show an image of the Horned King in the, uh, in the, in, yes, in the book I know with what the you're Magic Pig? Did yeah. you recognize the animation there? Yeah. Yep, yep. What other film was that? Ooh, 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 I'm sorry, can, can you repeat I'll repeat the question just for the sake of uh, uh, when the Horn King first appears in the bowl in the Black Cauldron the piece of animation used was taken from what other Disney film? This one. Is that Fantasia? Fantasia. Yes. The first, he, you guys go on and talk about how he's the most intimidating villain and in, in ever, which is which is true. I I had I uh I or one of the most uh, one of one of the like yeah. I wouldn't say the like immediately like. Def, but definitely one of. Yeah, and the first, so the first bit of footage that you see of him is taken from the only, uh, the earliest instance of Disney knowing how to scare the shit out of, out of their audience. <laughs> and yes, well, the. I wouldn't say one. I wouldn't say the first. Like. Keep in mind, audience are still freaked out about the the witch from Snow White. It wasn't quite no. as traumatizing as Night on, Night on Bald Mountain. She does not. No, that's true. <laughs> but no, but just saying, it's like hmm. it's not Disney's first attempt to try to scare scare their audiences. Oh well, yeah. They, they, they did have some scary scenes in Snow White. I remember the scene in the forest scared the shit out of me as a kid. Although I rewatched the movie recently, I rewatched Snow White, and the there were some dark moments. But I think the problem with Snow White is not with the character of Snow White or really any of the story stuff, but the fact that it's like seventy percent cutesy filler. Well, you got to keep in mind there I is mean, so like... much filler, you guys. Like twenty minutes of them like cleaning the house with the cute little animals. There's like so much of that shit. Well, like, I mean, tell a story. Mind, like... This is their first, I mean, this was their first animated feature, and, like, they they just came out of the huge success of the Silly Symphonies. So it, it, it does explain how the whimsiness is, like, to the max on that film. I do understand that. I just don't think it really holds up when we're used to, to movies that are kind of, like, more substantial. You know, it's not even that it's cutesy. It's that it, there's so much periods of time where nothing happens. Like, they just keep going and going and going. Here's a squirrel cleaning a plate, and here's some other squirrels cleaning the laundry, and look how cute they are. Look at the little baby bird. He's such a failure. He can't sing. <laughs> if, you, if you think Snow White is bad, I'm... This on the side, she's like, ha 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 ha. Yeah, I do like the character of Snow White, and I think people give her way too bad a rap. I think she's much better than people give her credit for. But the movie itself suffers from way too much filler if you that's think that's I... bad you should watch uh, you should watch uh, Gulliver's Travels should I though should I really James <laughs> should I watch Gulliver's Travels should mm, I I'm not no. going to recommend it no wait which one are you talking about the Fletcher film or the Jack Black film <laughs> the Fletcher film does it matter neither neither <laughs> <laughs> God. You know, I just realized that mostly everything we're gonna talk about tonight features John Hurt dying in the feature. Like he's he yeah. has died in everything we're gonna talk about. It's like, wait a minute, like, really? Oh, really? But I this I is... almost said he was like a British scene bean, and then I was like, wait. But I was going to transition saying there's one thing that James is going to talk about that he did not die in per se, and it's technically a TV series rather than a movie. That's the storyteller. You know, I, 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 
I, I'd love to hear about that, Mike, but I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking that I should go about now. James, I didn't explain this when you were here, but I have a, a very important exam in the, the morning. So Hellboy is pretty much all I got. Okay. So now okay. I should probably go. Okay. Don't okay. fine. That's fine. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Well, you're welcome for joining us, or whatever. I'm tired. Thanks for showing up not not as late as you could have, James. I had fun. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye, night. Till the next time. Ciao for now. Anyway, so, the storyteller. Well, yes. Um, the storyteller was actually my first introduction to uh, to John Hurt. Um, when we were when I was uh, when I was growing up, they uh, we had um, we had several episodes on tape, and uh, there was a there was a very short lived there was a very short lived um, TV series that Jim Henson did back in the uh, back in the eighties called uh, called the Jim Henson Hour. The first half of the show would be basically akin to the Muppet show uh, featuring the Muppets and all of their new hi- new higher tech antics I should say and the second half of the of it would be various other projects that Henson uh, wanted to work on such as uh, some of them were just TV movies other times they were recycled episodes of the storyteller and that's how I got introduced to this series, which actually first aired on HBO, I believe. The uh, the whole series was John Hurt as uh, the titular storyteller, a guy who sits by the fireplace with a dog played by Brian Henson and uh, narrates... Not just not just classic fairy tale stories, but pre grim fairy tale stories. Mm. Uh, this was this was all very interesting, and dare I say it, very very creative, very imaginative. This this whole series, um, I think that it's it's a formula that that I haven't seen anyone come close to uh, replicating sure we've had we've had TV shows that that tell stories but the the format that this that this tells it in is so very very engaging um, as as John Hurt is telling the story every time this you see you get a good look around this this fantastic elaborate room that he's in and uh, there's pictures and such all over the place and the stories that he tells come to life in these pictures it's almost uh, I guess I guess if I had to make a comparison it's it's kind of like the uh, the moving pictures in Harry Potter only if if we were to go inside of those inside of the the painting worlds there and hear all the stories of the characters that those that those guys had to offer this that's what the storyteller is and the um, the different ways in which he interacts with it uh, with the stories that he's telling, let's see what we had. Um, the ones we had on tape were the the story of Fear Not, uh, the story of a of a young man who was born without fear and goes on a journey to try and and figure out what fear is. Which it's it's actually uh, quite a creepy episode, but the amazing thing is he's not. Uh, he's not uh, afraid of anything, and then when he gets back home, he f- he suddenly finds out what fear is. And I'm not going to spoil it because it's good enough to look at yourself. 
But there was one there was one story that John Hurt actually John Hurt's storyteller actually puts himself in. And uh, that one if I'm going to I'm going to look it up right now. Storyteller episode list. Okay. So it's just called a short story. No wonder I had to look up the t- the name of it. <laughs> uh, yes, John Hurt puts himself in this story where he's uh, where he's he's walking around town. He's a beggar. He's got no money, and he sees uh, uh, he sees. Uh, a thief in trouble with the local king and he comes in and he tells him uh, he tells him you know what I'm uh, I believe uh, I believe I can help exonerate this man and what he does is uh, uh, the guy the guy was a a con man I think he was uh, I think he was pretending to be uh, he was pretending to be a chef, but he didn't know how to cook. So John Hurt steps in and says, "Know what? I got a really great, uh, I got a really great recipe for this guy. We're gonna make stone soup." And Whoa. so, stone soup. Does that even work? Well, here's how it works: you uh, you take a perfectly good stone, you put it in a you put it in the cauldron, preferably a black one, and you boil it up and you cut up carrots and onions and everything that you would usually put in the soup until you've got the flavor of the stone completely buried under there. Basically, he was BSing his way through there to try and save this guy's yeah. ass. And in return... He becomes the storyteller for the king, but he t- he goes for a year or so telling the king stories, and then on the and on the final day, he uh, he's out of stories. So what's he gonna do now? Well, the guy whose ass he saved in the beginning. Um, and uh, comes into play here and turns him into a rabbit. <laughs> so uh, after just uh, one crazy thing after another happens, uh, the the king's uh, the king's son goes missing during a magic trick. And uh, it's uh, it's a piling it's a pylon of catastrophes. Uh, but John Hurt comes back. He transforms back into a human being, and uh, he he goes to the king, and he finally has a story to tell. That afternoon, he was turned into a rabbit, and then he realizes something afterward. The guy, the guy whose ass he saved in the beginning, paid him back by giving him a story to use when he most needed it. So in that in that sense, I, I, it, it's not the best episode, but it, um, I would say. I would say that the series as a whole is is creative enough. If you like, if you like Jim Henson, if you like, uh, if you like puppetry, if you like, if you like fairy tales, this is a 
a series that I I can't recommend enough. And it's all on all nine episodes are on DVD, so check it out from the library. Well, that's interesting. You know, like um, I've never seen any of the episodes, but it's pretty surprising to see um, like to, to to actually find this. And I was actually surprised to find that this is actually a very short uh, a very short series. Like it only had nine ep- it only has like nine episodes. But I guess, like, when you think about it, like, in this time period, it does make sense, considering that, the, like, knowing my biography of Jim Henson, uh, the, like, it does seem like during the time when he wants to be more experimental and, like, try to go beyond the Muppets and Sesame Street and stuff like that. So, like, I could see him do something like this, especially, like, like I'm, I'm sure this would have been, like, some idea... Uh, was this released before or after the Jim Henson hour? This was during, I think. No, uh, no, like apparently said, after. Actually, it was after. You know, like no, this. Uh, they, uh, I'm, I'm telling this, you, I had the videotapes. Well, I don't know. From what I found, apparently, like the series went on from 1987 to 1988. And Jim Henson Hour was 1989. Okay, so it aired. It aired before the Jim. Henson. It aired before the Jim Henson Hour. Yeah, but like, yeah. So said, like, it, it is interesting. They just like, took elements from the show and brought mm-hmm. it over to the Jim Henson Hour. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It or was like just what they were running the second half of it. Yeah. So, so yeah, there you go. Uh, it also still has somewhat of a legacy to it. Um, you can uh, yeah, you can you can find images of the of the show and episodes online clearly, but much further down the line, there was actually a comic book adaptation. They decided to follow it up with uh, with a comic series sometime just uh, what a couple of years ago, and here is the uh, here's a an image from it. I've never read it, but um, that, that that's dog's crazy. <laughs> the dog was always an interesting character. He was. He was always overreacting to the the storyteller's stories, and so that so that kind of face is not altogether uncommon. But um, as you can see, they still retain the likeness of John Hurt and the storyteller. Right. Mm-hmm. And I imagine that the stories themselves probably followed suit. If you wanna, if you wanna hear stories like, uh, if you want, so if you wanna find out about stories like um, Sap Sorrow, which came before the story of Cinderella, or Hans my Hedgehog, the story that came before Beauty and the Beast. Hans my Hedgehog. Yes. Hans my Hedgehog. Yes, the uh, the earlier version of Beauty and the Beast, historically speaking, was uh, revolved around um, a man who was half man, half hedgehog. Oh, right. So, and it's like part Beauty and the Beast. So, is it like this man, like this man hedgehog, fall in lo- like falls in love with a girl or something? Yes, and uh, she. Yes, and he has a castle and everything, and she brings it upon herself to uh, to to cure him of this curse. Oh, okay. okay. I think I've heard of that. I think I've heard of that story before. It's called Sonic O Six. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. Nice. It had to come into play somehow. Somewhere, somehow. 
Like, where where else can you find the, a love story between a hedgehog and a human girl? Yep, he's got it. Hit it right on the nail. Hey, kids, there's nothing more more uh, more <laughs> awesome than living in your own castle. But if a girl tries to move into your castle, that's no that's good. That's no good. <laughs> <laughs> it's your so deformed you hedgehog body. No one should be allowed to touch it by yourself. So what do you do? You say no way, and then you get out of there. <laughs> and then you wait until years later when she pr- when she tracks you down, and she's got completely white hair. And then you break the spell. <laughs> so. Let's go back in time to a film take place during the Roman Greek times, per se. It came out last year in 2014. It was actually the second Hercules film that came out. Yes, I'm talking about Hercules, the Brett Ratner film starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson and John Hurt. John Hurt. Mm-hmm. I first yeah. saw this a while back, and I was like, you know what, I should show this to the guys here, just to see what their reactions were to it, and it's it's a popcorn flick, to say the least. It, it's not the greatest film in the world, but it's, it's, it's entertaining, you know, if you want to get entertained, you pop this movie in, have a good time, be done with it. Mm-hmm. John Hurt plays this king who hires um, Hercules, who is a who is a mercenary, to you know train his troops to fight against the enemy of his. And later on, there's a twist where uh, he just backstabs him in the back, and he's the villain of the film all of a sudden. Which I kind of notice he does play a lot of villain roles in his filmography. Mm-hmm. That's why I was so glad to grow up with him being the storyteller. Because he's such a nice man there. <laughs> yeah. God, turned into such a prick lately. I, 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 just wondering, James, is like, isn't the dog paranoid in the storyteller? Kinda, yeah. Okay, then there is a reason. <laughs> Okay, go on with Hercules. Yeah, um, I, 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 I was, I wasn't expecting a role, a, a role like this for John Hurt. I mean, I haven't seen any other villainous roles by him in the past. So when I watched it the first time, I was like, okay, okay, he plays the king. Okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. Oh, I'm gonna hire you to do this. this should have... All of a sudden, he, at the end, he starts, you know. Just ripping Hercules into a new one, like just yelling at him. It's like, where, where, where did this come from? Like, holy shit! He's like a badass. He's taking, taking his grandson, you know, trying to threat to kill him, you know. And it was just like, wow, pulled by the hair of the head. I was like, what the fuck, John? <laughs> Jesus! I, scared I have anger issues, and I've kept it all in during this whole time. I had to let it out somehow. <laughs> you don't mess with them. I mean, he just like, I was like, like having a good time. I was like, whoa, keep it up, man. Keep, yeah, just, just piss Hercules off because he just agitates Hercules to no end, and he gets, pit, Hercules is pissed off and pissed off, and at the end, you know, he got his. Uh, you know, a little taste of revenge is like, boom, you're dead. It's, I don't know, I'm, Brett Renner, you know, he could do a, a good action piece if he can put his mind to it, but, you know, it just, it's a different side of Hercules. It's, it's not like the typical Hercules story you're thinking of. It's like, this is, this is Hercules if he's like a mercenary and he's killing people and, you know, training and, you know, all that stuff. Like, mm-hmm. this is... It's really interesting. It's like, it's kind of weird how they took this Hercules um, 
the, the like the Hercules mythos. Like they did it in a more realistic kind of manner, where like it's not really, where like the legends aren't really legends. They're not really myths. They're like more exaggerated terms. Like instead of a, like when he battled the five headed Hydra, like it's not really a Hydra like a dragon per se. It's just like a group of guys wearing dragon helmets. Right. And like he. Like he came back with the heads of of them, like in a bag and stuff like that. But uh, once... I found that so funny because at the at that one point I was just like, "Look, Scooby, it's Old Man Smithers." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but the one thing I will say about Hercules is that technically, as a like as a movie, I wouldn't really say it's really good per se because the thing is that. I've seen this film before. Like, this is the kind of movie, it's like, it's a more, it's a movie that's more action, it's, it's a more action-y movie that features a lot of uh, funny one-liners and, like a, like, a crew, like, one popular person and behind him is, like, a popular, like, well, like, a group of rogues behind him that are helping him out. Like, you know, like, you got Xena Warrior, like, Xena Warrior Princess from the Amazon... <laughs> You got Han Solo. You got Animal from from the Muppets, and then you got like, like this like the wise old man that wants to die for some reason, and that's his comedic shtick, <laughs> or something like that. But like, what I'm refer what I'm getting at is that, um, have you guys seen the 2011 Robin Hood with uh, Russell Crowe? Um, no, but I've heard it's rather. It's rather infamous. I, I saw it on a list of movies that were almost great, but sucked due to certain reasons. Uh, but I can't comment on it for myself. It's No, because like Hercules is pretty much exactly like Robin Hood. It's, it's a popcorn flick. Uh, it runs like it, it runs by um, action action and um, and one liners. You got you got the popular figure. That is the title of the movie with his band of rogues, and also that it's it has to do very little with the story that it's based on, but um, but like it, it's it's pretty much the same thing. Like the, like as you can see, like they're both pretty similar. But this is not to say that Hercules is a bad movie. A lot of the action scenes are like. What they did execute, they did execute it pretty well. Uh, the, you know, like the action is actually really interesting to watch. It is a lot of fun. Uh, the, uh, like the characters, they are pretty likable, and and also like the the one line, like a lot of the one liners and some of the jokes, like they are effective. They are pretty humorous. So, in a way, it's not it's not the best movie. It's like it's not. It's not really that great of a movie. It's not really original, but it's entertaining to say the least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is a good movie. Uh, well, I'm gonna say okay, popcorn, popcorn. Uh, but um, the the one thing I like about this film is how much it plays with your expectations. There is, you think you know the. You you think you know what you're going to see because, you know, it's, it's a story about Hercules and they've already said so much. Yeah, you know, I because I grew up watching I grew up watching Hercules Legendary Journeys. Uh, by the way, I, I still think uh, Kevin Sorbo is is my Hercules, but um, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is. Is pretty good, but he's he's still Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Plus uh, the fact he... I forgot to mention, I don't know, like you, I'm sure you guys noticed, but like he's pretty much the only person in there with an American accent, while everyone else has a British accent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the weird aspects that I find about about freaking Hercules in this. Is like, come on. Like, come on, Dwayne. At least try. Yeah, at least get an accent or something and go in there because you're freaking Hercules. So, so yeah, with uh, you, you think um, because this is uh, ancient Roman times, 
all the stuff that all the stuff that you heard about uh, all the stuff you've heard about Hercules, about whether or not he did the trials, about whether or not he fought monsters. Uh, you think you go in here thinking that you're going to see mythical beasts of of all sorts, and uh, there there is the bit the big surprise is it's like Sherlock Holmes, you know. There's there's a perfectly logistical reason for everything everything supernatural that happens, except for except for his strength. They uh, they don't. They don't manage to explain where that came from. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's. Uh, we we don't know if he's really born of of Zeus, uh, the Cerberus, fake, uh, the uh, the centaurs. There's a pretty interesting twist with the centaurs. I don't know if I should spoil it or not. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 a unique twist on it. It was just like. Are there really centaurs? Are know. there really centaurs, or or do you just need 3D glasses? Yeah, yeah. This this was released in 3D. It was like a post conversion 3D kind of thing. But, mm. I, but I couldn't tell. Um, and that's part of uh part of that was actually what pissed some people off about this was that a a down, a, a trying to be down to earth Hercules story. Yeah, we, you know, no mythical elements. Everything's a, uh, everything's got an explanation to it. That's absurd. That's unheard of. And you feel like, uh, you feel like you're you're going to get that after you see the trailers of the movie. Exactly. And you see mm -hmm. him fighting all of these monsters, that's, but that's like the first. Like third of the movie, they, it's exposition for the film, pretty much. You see all the creatures at the beginning, or some of it's a hallucination or something like that. Yeah, they don't, they don't. the The marketing team was very, I, I should say, they were very clever here. Mm. They were clever in disguising this movie. So, was it was it worth it? Um, not. I'm for one. I'm not gonna say go out and run out and watch this thing. It's it, it was. It's just sort of if it's there, you know, watch it. And Mike, uh, your opinion? Hercules for me, you know, because I knew it, I knew it came out last year, and I knew John Hurt was in it. I knew everything about it at least, and I was like, okay, trailer's pretty good, sure, and I was. And I had fun watching it. I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. You know, there's a, a lot of action. Like, I'm a huge action person. And I was like, yeah, I heard of Hercules. I know some of the mythos of it. I think I've seen a Dizzy Hercules. I know Kevin Sorbo is Hercules. You know. Yeah, it's not something you should rush out and go watch right away. It's if you want something to, you know... You know, something for your brain to and like try to figure out. You know, it's like it's not a typical Hercules movie, but it's just something if you want to see Dwayne the Rock Johnson all buffed up as can be. You know, he trains so hard for the role because he he actually uh, trained for eight months straight, buffing up for this film, and you know he was locked up in his apartment, you know, doing all this shit, and he actually, you know, he wanted to make this 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 for for Dwayne the Rock Johnson. This is his baby he promoted it like it was like his prized possession like he was really amazed with hercules he was like mm. he pro he was like okay sure if you liked it so much sure let people watch it <laughs> i mean plus if you want to ch check the movie out because of the fact that his beard in the film is actually made of yak ball hair testicle hair <laughs> It's pretty much he, he. It's pretty much he has yak pubes on his face. Exactly. You'd be like, wait, really? Is that? That, that he has pubic hair. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah, but if you notice, a pubic hair, or or in this case, testicle hair, is uh, it's got sort of a more wiry consistency to it, uh -huh. other than say fur. Uh, 
Exactly. It's so <laughs> <Why Yeah>. not? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Is that something you should share here? <laughs> we have gone a lot we, weirder and dirtier. Before. We all three of us haven't. Come on, we're all guys here. Come on. All true. <laughs> Still, like, do we need to go into details <laughs> about the fabric of a testicle hair? What? I mean, the, the makeup yeah. department. The makeup department did it actually. Cause I think he explained that it took like hours for him to put like each little hair on his face, you know, each little bit and individually. Jeez. Yeah, I just it was just like, you know, it took a lot of effort into it. No, no, no. It, it looks like a legit. Like I'll admit, it, it still it looks like a, a a little scruffy little beard. Yeah, I was just like, I thought that was amazing. I was like, what? What? But yeah, just if you wanna. Check it out for whatever reason. You know, if you like action, you like, you know, you want to see Ian McShane being this guy who wants to be killed, you know, but he ends up living at the end. Spoiler <laughs> if you alert. Want, if you want death to be like a running gag, then this movie is for you. Like, yeah, I'm ready to die. Like, my time has come. Or maybe not. Damn it. No, but there's, and one thing I want to mention, um, like, like definitely check this out because this is way better than the other Hercules movie, no, the yeah, um, exactly. Legend of Hercules. Uh, funny enough, just today, um, uh, I found my parents watching uh, the Legend of Hercules, and even they thought it was stupid because it looked like <laughs> such a gladiator ripoff. Like, and not even an impressive one. Even the Hercules in there looks like a freaking wimp. There you have it. Straight from Match Mouth. Mm. Don't watch the other Hercules movie. Check out this one. Where Dwayne the one Rock Johnson. Or, you know, the Disney one also is in there. <laughs> or check out Kevin Sorbo as Hercules. Disappointed. Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointed. <laughs> Gotta know that part. <laughs> oh, good times. Um, let's get into some animated goodness here with The Lord of the Rings, 1978 yep. animated film, which is kind of inspired Peter Jackson to adapt into Lord of the Rings. His movie. Into yeah. his films. He yep. chose Lord of the Rings, not Watership Down. Wait, was he in Watership Down? Yes. Uh, I don't know. I kind of forgot. He's elite. <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway. Well, I picked Lord of the Rings because, like, I thought it was something that would be more interesting to talk about. And, like, the, like I've actually seen Lord of the Rings. In, uh, I have not yet seen Watership Down, but I will. Uh, but anyways, Lord of the Rings... Um, I gotta say, it really is interesting. Uh, like, because nowadays we all know about the Peter Jackson films and stuff like that, but with this film, this is actually a combination, um, an adaptation of both uh, Fellowship of the Ring and Two Towers, all told in, uh, t in a two-hour, like, more than a two-hour film. And, um, like, it really, it sounds like a crazy... Like, it sounds like a crazy thing to do, considering that there's so much. And, like, even Peter Jackson had to split it into two, three-hour films. But, like, I will admit, Ralph Bakshi has done it. But um, I will say there are – I just need to get out of the way. Two of the major, uh, two of the major like, issues that I kind of have with the movie – and, like, they may sound stupid, but, like, it is a little reasonable when, I, when I'll explain it. Number one – it's kind of like it's a, like I find it a little cartoony in a way. I know that sounds stupid because well, it's an animated Lord of the Rings. What do you expect? But let me explain. Um, it's cartoony in a sense where like n not intentionally cartoony. They d they don't make it like it's it's not like Lord of the Rings as told by freaking Hanna Barbera. This was more like um, Wait, it's like un there is a way. It's unintentionally Where cartoony. They would do things that it's a little much. Uh, some examples include like uh, 
Like a lot of the designs, they're not that frightening. Like a lot of like the orcs in the movie, they look freaking goofy. They are not frightening. They just look they just look goofy. They look like dumb Vikings added like big sharp teeth and like red dots in their eyes. And they're it's it's just godforsaken goofy. And also, then there's Sam, which if you think in the Peter Jackson films, you think like you make all these jokes like, oh, Sam is gay for Frodo. The Peter Jackson films hint it. The Ralph Bakshi film confirms it. This dude, Sam, holy crap. Like, I don't know how to describe Sam. It's like, he's just there like... Like, very pompous and always so dependent of Mr. Frodo. It's like, oh my, oh my. Like, not exaggerating. And sometimes they would do so many goofy things. Like, you know the infamous scene is like when, when um, Frodo shows Bilbo Baggins the ring and then he goes, ah. In the movie, he just got, the, he gets these wobbly arms. Like, he's slowly going towards the ring, going like, Literally, and also Smeek, and then you got Smeagol slash Gollum, that. and then you got Smeagol slash Gollum, like, he comes out, he has this weird, goofy voice, like, you don't know Smeagol, I'm the circus performance, more or less this, but, but this one, yes, in the movie, in the Ralph Bakshi movie, he, he sounds a bit like a, 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 a British Bring goofy. Oh yes, the precious. I love the precious. The Smeagol would be nice, yes. And uh, Smeagol, follow Smeagol. Yeah, and also another a cartoony element. I just realized. My God, Gandalf is he is very short tempered in this movie. Like literally, like he cannot take a single crap. Like he gets mad so easily. <laughs> There's literally, okay, literally there's this one scene, like, they're just walking out, they they dodged an obstacle, it was like, come, we have to go, uh, come, we cannot sit here with this monster, and then Pippin is there, it's like, yeah, and that monster almost took Frodo, shut up, Pippin! <laughs> like, no, le- no legit, that I actually quoted, he, he went there, it's just like, shut up, Pippin! And, oh my god, but... Moving along, the second complaint that I have with this movie is that it feels a little too long. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, Animator's complaining that The Lord of the Rings is too long. Hold on. Now let me explain that. Um, One of the biggest reasons is that they really try to emphasize on many of the action scenes. But in this film the action scenes aren't really that engaging and they feel pretty long. Like I remember the first time I watched it, I I think I kind of slept like, I think I slept through a good chunk of it. And, um, also the fighting scenes, they, they are pretty bad. Like it feels like you're watching a school play considering with all the costumes and stuff like that. And also Mm -hmm. in terms of the animation, um, we all know about Ralph Bakshi's uh, rotoscoping, where he pretty much draws over live action. There are mm-hmm. times when he would do it to the point where it doesn't look like animation anymore. Like it looks like, um, like it looks, it still looks like live action, but with a different filter. So it just looks like cheap. Like it looks like something out of live action with cheap costumes, doing these fake sword fightings, like. You know, Something it, it, you could it, do it, nowadays if you just ran it through Photoshop. Yeah, pretty much. So like, it looks like something you can easily do uh, for like twenty five bucks. But this is not to say that it is oh. bad. Uh, but it's not really to say that it is bad. The like the heart, like many of the like many of the other characters, when they do something right, they really do something right. Frollo really is a great character in here. Probably, arguably, even better than how he how he is. In uh, the Peter Jackson films, a lot of the characters are interesting. Like they do give out a lot of heart, and like a lot of the quiet moments are really in- impactful. And then you also got, um, but to the point of this episode, then you also got John Hurt, who surprisingly is not a villain, and he doesn't die at the end because he plays Aragorn. 
um, like he pretty much plays this. He's pretty much this bad, like pretty much the badass helper. Like he he doesn't take crap from a- anyone, and um, like he's friends with Gandalf, and like he he knows some of the people in the Middle Earth, and like he's pretty much full blown serious. He he's pretty much full blown serious about the quest, and like he wants to, like make sure like the greater good prevails, and like he wants to help like the hobbits and stuff like that. And I remember one of the lines that does make him such a serious and like badass character is like he talked about the ring and was like if I wanted the ring then I sh- then I would have and I would have it now. And he brings out his sword and it's like it really is interesting. So yeah, like um again kind of like like again kind of like uh Black Cauldron like I, I highly recommend to check it out at least once. Um, definitely not as good as, uh, uh, li- like I said, like it's not really, it's not as good as the Peter Jackson films for sure. But wow. it definitely is, um, it definitely is a good attempt. When they do something right, they really do something right. And um, yeah, pr- pretty much that's my take on Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I, th- I think you you pretty much said it all. This was uh, this was the first version of Lord of the Rings that I saw, and I did see it when I was a kid. I saw it when I saw it later as an adult, um, and I I don't. To be honest with you, I don't remember too much of it. <laughs> Embarrassingly enough. Oh, but I do. I just remember that they that they wanted to do the entire saga, and they only got the first two books worth crammed into the film. Uh, the The film was not financially successful enough for a third film. So that uh, if you wanted to round that out, you would have to watch the Rankin Bass Return of the King special, which. Uh, in no way, shape, or form holds up to uh, holds up to uh, the Ralph Bakshi. But I I I do like what you I do like um, I do like the rotoscope look that the that the film has that is that's always stuck out in my mind. The key mm-hmm. moments, how they're executed, those have stuck out in my mind. Oh, yeah. um, I, also, I also remember, I think we were on a... This is not the only way that that particular version has been packaged. It's also been packaged as a as an audio cassette version of, uh, of the story. Mm. So they just took the movie cut it up into pieces and uh, and put it on cassette and you can listen to it in your car on the way to work that uh, but I if I have to pick a, a Bakshi film though I'm going to go with American Pop mm, Right. you know honestly I need to check out a few more uh Ralph Bakshi works like I I know them very well like from First the Cat to Heavy Traffic and American Pop and stuff like that but I like I I need to take a good look look at those because like that that would be like because they're literally animated features that are unlike any other considering the the subject matter is something that no animation studio nowadays would want to get into like (laughs) yeah you know because it's, it's a family picture Ironically enough, I I do have to say, funny enough, I do have to say that The Lord of the Rings is probably Ralph Bakshi's, like, most family-oriented picture. Like, well, like that and Fire think and Ice, which is getting a remake. Yeah, true. Well, Fire and Ice, uh... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Considering the girls in there, what they're wearing, <laughs> I would say more it's Lord of the Rings. Worse than the Little Mermaid. <laughs> well, uh, 
I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. Mm -hmm. Let's honestly, before I go on, uh, I have not seen a majority of films we had talked about on this podcast. I've not seen Hellboy. I have not seen Black Cauldron. What? I have not seen Lord of the Rings. You're not. You didn't I see have... Hellboy, dude. It's on my to watch list. I have a lot of superhero films I have to get through. Yeah, I have. I've heard of it. I think I've seen it on TV once, but otherwise, like I said, I have not seen all of these films, so that's why I'm not voicing my opinion on none of these because I have no fucking clue what to say about them. Yes, yes. Oh, I didn't watch this film. Oh, I didn't watch that film. I still got time. Leave me alone. <laughs> but you came up with this up uh, with this with John okay. Hurt as our subject. You relied on us so that you you didn't have to do all the work for your show. <laughs> Shit. Got me. Wow. First of all, anybody's got my plan down to it. Yes, I rely on other people to bring in stuff that I've never seen before so I can, like, hear from your perspective so I can be like, oh, a friend recommended this to me. I'll check it out. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, okay. I'm just like, oh, this is a random film. Maybe I'll check it out. Maybe not. There, now you know the basic gist of the podcast. I lazily watch two movies while everybody else talks about movies that I have not seen personally. Okay. Anyways. Except you have seen our last film here. It's you than me, by the way. Except the last one. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, I have seen this at least, and I've seen it being spoofed. And yes, it's the iconic role of Kane in Alien. And mm -hmm. you should know oh. what that leads into. Yes. Welcome to the... This is my, this is my pick. Alien, uh, the... The famous Ridley Scott film, which is a remake, no one ever. It's a uh, sort of taken over the the popular perspective. Of the story, Alien is a remake. Look it up. Um, a whole plot of this film in case you there's a bunch of folks uh, going out going out into space uh, come across a, a bunch of alien pods and uh, one of them gets infected uh, the alien creature pops out of his stomach and goes crazy and kills over half the crew so what does John Hurt have to do with this is he the hero no he never is well, I, I should say, no, he, he is, uh, clearly we, clearly he is a heroic type in movies like Lord of the Rings, but is he a main? No. Here, he does play a pivotal role. Uh, he has the honor of playing the first guy, uh, who has the alien burst out of his chest. Yes, he's the guy who gets infected, who gives birth to the alien. Yep. That's a, that, honestly like that never really crossed my mind. I didn't, I didn't know that was actually John Hurt. And and, and you you think about it, he's like uh, like Mike said it earlier. He's not a he's not a a lead. Uh, He's not a typical lead actor or anything. He typically plays side roles and whatnot. Uh, but this uh, this role is actually honorary. 
honorary. You know, some people have the honor of being. You know, Bill Paxton has to be has the honor of being uh, killed off, being the first guy to be killed off by a Terminator. Um, Alfred Molina has the honor of being the guy who didn't throw Indiana Jones the whip. Um, John Hurt has the guy has the honor of being the first guy to ever get eaten out by an alien. Yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. John Hurt wasn't the original actor who was supposed to play the part of Kane. It was a guy named John Finch who was casted before John Hurt. And he became ill on the first day of shooting and was diagnosed with severe diabetes, which led into other serious stuff. So John Hurt was uh, pulled in to play the part of Kane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was it was a role that would uh, that would somewhat define define his career. Pretty much. I I say that well, not that he he kept on playing B movie characters who died or anything mm-hmm. like that, but yeah. he had the honor of of making fun of his own, own role. Uh, some ten odd years later, when they made when they made the movie Spaceballs, he actually reprises his role from Alien as the guy who gets the chest busted out. He's in the scene. He's in the scene near the the end of Spaceballs, where they're all eating at some cafe at at some restaurant. Yes, yes. And then his the alien pops out of his stomach and he looks at it and he says, not again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's great. It's great to know. It's great to hear when like they do their, uh, like when they, they make fun of their own, their own roles. It's like, they're, they're being good sports like that. John, John Hurd really is it. Like he, he, he was a good sport. Like doing, doing that space balls role. Definitely mm-hmm. was nice. Mm-hmm. Yes. The yes. rest of the, the rest of the film. It. What. What can I. What can I say that that hasn't already been said. Um. I. I always. He, here's the one thing that that, I didn't notice. That I never noticed the first time I I saw this film. Uh. But people came to keep to sing. People seem to keep wanting to bring this up every time they discuss in depth uh, this movie. Uh, phallic imagery. A lot of well, the head. I mean, well, there is the. There is the head, and it, it's of the alien. It, it's sort of shaft-like, but I always looked at it like it was a, it, it was a rutabaga or something, or a cucumber. <laughs> so we got an angry, we got an angry alien whose head is a cucumber. <laughs> Speaking of phallic, I'm mm-hmm. reading the trivia right now, and it said, it says shredded. Condoms were used to create tendons on the beast's ferocious jaws. That's why in some that that's why when I was going to school uh, for for film, there was a there we had a whole lecture in our our sci-fi class about how uh, about how sexual alien is and. <laughs> And I'm just sitting back thinking, you know, I, I never stop to think that when the alien grimaces, suddenly the, if you flip the image upside down, it looks like a penis. I don't need to, I don't, I don't need to think that while watching the movie. And well, those hug, those, those huggers, they are pretty horny little buggers. <laughs> Yeah, that that that's that is one thing that I'll that I'll grant people when they when they interpret this is that the you know the whole the whole concept of face hugging and then having something get be 
born in your stomach and come out there, uh, that is that is a sexual act. That is definitely a sexual act because uh, you know you've got a you, you've got this this thing's thing going down your throat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And like even the it's sound really... they make, like. It it drains its fluids into you when you give birth to its, its uh, offspring. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the uh, filming of that iconic scene was pretty interesting to find out. Um, John Hurt and the crew were the only people that knew about the scene, and in the script it just said it comes out. It doesn't say how or will or whenever it comes out. So the cast, the rest of the cast didn't know what's going to happen. John Hurt was like sitting down in a chair. His, just, his arms were just sticking out in his torso. The rest of his body is just like fabricated for the film. So they did it in one take and it took four cameras to film it. And um, just that's the real reaction when the first popped up. That's the real reaction to the actors. Like that one shot, boom, they got their reactions to it. There was one point in the scene where blood got shot out and it hit one of the actress's eyes and she fell over. Which is hilarious. Oh, my. But yeah, that's just this... When you think of John Hurt, you think of that scene alone. Because it's just like, that's kind of a starting point, like, more or less. Like, when he was really young... Mm-hmm. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, now you know something interesting about John Hurt. Yeah, we. I I remember approaching my professor after the class. They. Uh, uh, what he was doing, he was showing a scene where where. Uh, uh, the character Ripley is uh, is is putting on some sort of spacesuit before before she fights with the alien. And uh, I came up to the professor after the class and I said, uh, I couldn't help but notice after uh, before she gets rough with the alien, she has to put on protection. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. So, more or less, a couple of films here and there, John Hurt dies, and then, so a few films he didn't. But this film that I watched, called Snowpiercer, that came out last year in the U.S., it's originally released in 2013, and it's a South Korean film, directed by Bong Joon-ho. Snowpiercer or Snortpiercer? Snowpiercer. No. Did I say Snort? It sounded like snort to me. What do you think, Matt? A uh, bit, you know, like... You, you said it a little too fast. <laughs> snort. Snort piercer. Maybe, maybe I just said that because I'm having a snort piercer right now. <laughs> Anyways, snow piercer. It's a post apocalyptic dystopian future film. Starring John Hurt, Chris Evans, Ed Harris, and basically, it's Bung, Bung Jun Ho's first um, English film, which has about 8% of it being English and half being the other percentage being like Korean. So, it's a foreign film for you people out there, mostly. It's an English film as well. You can, I just watched it in subtitles, so it was all good. Basically, in 2014, there's this global, uh, global, global, global warming. Yes, thank you. I'm sick and I'm can't think right now. Global warming issue going on, and us Americans figure we we're, we're just gonna shoot this rocket, you know, that's gonna bring the temperature down, so it doesn't cause any global warming anymore. Well, it turns out that that rocket we shot up actually froze the whole earth like everybody died 
and help, Earth has frozen over. So basically this guy named Wilfred, he built this huge train that help, that holds everybody who survived from that whole uh, ice age, pretty much. And then it's separated into different classes. You got the tail section, which is all the, the poor people, you know, all the lesser known people. And then you work your way up to the front, and you got the higher class people. And it's just Earth on train. It's just everybody on train. And basically, Chris Evans plays Curtis, who wants to, you know, get to the front of the train, you know, to, to take control of the train, because he's sick of the bullshit he's getting, been dealing with over the years. Ever since that happened, John Hurt plays this, like this wise elderman who's lived through it all, and he does die. Spoiler alert! In the middle of the film, but he, you find out about John Hurt's character where he's like this kind, wise man. Like you see him in the film, he's got these crutches. You know, he's he's got a, like a peg leg. He's got like an arm made of like parts, you know, and it's revealed that, you know, when they first arrived on the train, there was no, like, no food, no water, no nothing, so they had to resort to cannibalism, so there's one point where this guy had a knife, there was a baby, and they want to eat the baby, and John Hurt's character was like, hey, I want to cut my arm, arm off, and here, eat my arm, forget about the baby, eat my arm instead, and so that's what happened. They ate the arm, and, you know, other people are like, okay, let's cut our arms off. Let's cut our legs off so people can eat. <laughs> you don't actually see what? it. You don't actually see it happen. It's actually told in a very emotional uh, monologue. Too many cooks. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, when the cannibalism got out of hand, um, the train started to produce these... Um, these protein bars, you know, these black gelatin protein bars, which are made out of bugs for people to eat on the tail section of the train. So, like I said, Curtis and John, um, what the fuck is John Hurt's character's name? Uh, hold on a sec. I got this. Uh, uh Curtis, no, not Curtis. Uh, Gilliam. 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 Gilliam and Curtis try to lead this rebellion against this whole train. You know, as they climb up and up and up, you know, you see, and you can see the train in glorious fashion. You know, there's different sections of the train. You see the tail end; it's all crappy. You know, it's all bunks. It's all cramped. Then you get get a little further up. You know, there's this, you know, there's um, they want to take over this water section of it, and they're like, "Are you nuts? Uh, that's not the whole section of the train. That's like part of for your water. If you want to take over the water, that's for you guys." The way that water is retained for the snow piercer is that every time the train passes through ice or snow it sucks up the w snow and ice and turns it into water for people it's just this big action piece kind of film where you know you understand the characters because there's a lot of character developments in these characters like kids could get taken from their mothers and tail section to move up and to train for you know child labor it's like a very emotional piece. It's like so raw and emotional to watch these characters happen. Like there's one point where this one character throws a shoe at like a higher end, you know, person and he gets punished by putting his arm outside in the freezing cold where it's all frozen solid. All of a sudden, whack, his arm just breaks right off. That's what you get for throwing your shoes at people, which you think about that scene, it kind of reminds you of George Bush being hit by the shoe by that person way back oh, yeah. then. So that was kind of inspiration for us. It's, this film is a very, you know, it has a lot of meaning. Are you saying that guy should have had his arm frozen off or something? <laughs> Possibly, if it was really freaking cold out. Uh, uh. This film has a lot of meanings and messages behind it, especially, you know, with society... In class, you know, and um, Leon Leon Thompson of Renegade Cut has devoted an episode dedicated to Snowpiercer. If you want to understand what's behind all all the messages and what the film was actually, you know, trying to tell, 
go watch that video alone because he'll tell you that stuff I won't tell you because for me I don't really care about that stuff I'm more into you know the story the characters and probably the action of the film um yeah I saw the uh I saw the Leon Thomas uh episode that I think um I think I get a pretty good gist of it from there and that's probably about as far as I'm gonna go exactly that's all you need to know <laughs> it's like if you really want to take a step further and watch the film go ahead because it's honestly the best film of 2014 to be honest Ooh. wow that's a bold statement it's it's yeah, yeah really. i'm pushing it baby i'm i'm saying it because i think that's what it is but i still think it was godzilla <laughs> <laughs> it's dropped down since then <laughs> Aww. You, know, you know, funny, funny enough, my friends actually, they they actually call it right now the best movie that's rated six out of ten. Funny enough, not not Snowpiercer, but Godzilla. Godzilla. Yeah, okay, that's mm. what I kind of figured. Six out of ten. <laughs> best movie based on six out of ten. That's funny. Um, but Chris Evans in this film, you get this character development from Curtis. You know, at first he's like, I'm not a leader. I'm not a leader, you know, and he's like, Gilliam, John Hurt, you're, you're the leader, you know better than I do, and Gilliam, you know, John Hurt, you know, trying to push his Curtis, Chris Evans' character, to, to push forward as a leader, and there's this scene at the end, towards the end of the film, where he breaks down in tears and talks about it, what happens in the past, and it's, like, very emotional, and it's, like, an Oscar clip, pretty much. It was like, wow, I didn't know Chris Evans could act like that, because I've seen him in Captain America or Fantastic Four, all those comic book films, and it just makes me cry sometimes. Just a tear jerking <laughs> moment about Chris Evans. <laughs> it Poor is Chris. It, it, it's it's that one film that you you might like if you like dystopian films. There's one point in the film where they go through a cart, and it's this side cart uh, full of, of these guys who are, like, have this mask on, and they have axes, and they're like, they're like, who, who are these people? And there's this axe fight all of a sudden. There's, like, there's axe thrown around, being slashing. There's a part where they go in, into a tunnel. It's all dark. There's, like, a night vision scene where you see a point of view of one of the guys, and there's night vision throughout you know you go see spam bam with the axe it's like there's a lot of action in it and it's very good for the uh, action junkies out there like I have mm. very well interesting but like I said uh, John Hurt does get killed like in the middle of it so it's like Aww. there's like he can I did I mention that John Hurt gets killed? Because <laughs> that's the theme of the podcast. John Hurt dies in most films. Not Lord of the Rings, not the storyteller, but the rest of them, sure. How ironic that like the one place where he wouldn't die would be in Middle Earth during the great battle with the Ring. How ironic! Mm -hmm. How ironic! Ah, uh, yes, yeah, so, for God's sakes, please, if you're interested in the basic gist of Snowpiercer, please give it a watch, because it's one of those underrated films of 2014 that needs needs to be watched, because it got a limited release in the U.S. Oh, the Weinstein Company picked it up, and it just got distributed to very small theaters around the world are very limited and not a lot of people saw it in the theaters so hmm. I don't know how they jip in it like that but it's I guess what the Weinstein company wanted to like cut some stuff out and add like narration at the end and the beginning and the director's like oh no 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 none of that shit I want to keep it all straight up and original with my stuff I'm not changing anything with my film and that's why it's got it got limited release at the time 
in July of 2014. All right. Hmm. Yes, John Hurt is the legendary actor that we love to see him continue acting on and on. He, uh... He's still working on stuff. He's currently filming a film this year. And he's been announced for a film coming out in 2016 called Tarzan. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Which uh, should be interesting to find out what all that's about. Yeah, it's about time that we get, like, an actual Tarzan movie. You know, like, I'm surprised. It's, like, the latest memorable Tarzan movie, like, that I could think of is actually the Disney movie. You know? Well, in between that one and now, there was one with uh, Casper Van Dien, I think. Yeah, but, but one that, like, it's, like, mainstream and that people know about, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because, like, like, maybe it's time that we need a new Tarzan movie where we think, other than the fact that he has a friend that is a Rosie O'Donnell monkey. <laughs> I think what you're trying to say here is uh, the fir- this is the maybe mainstream is not the term you're looking for. Maybe the term you're looking for is actually good. Maybe. <laughs> Either or. <laughs> uh... Hopefully it'd be better than uh, Tarzan 3D. Oh yeah. Came out. How ironic is it the most memorable like, the memorable and actually good recent Tarzan film is the one that goes, Shub-a-dub-ba-ba-da-ba-ba-da-ba-do-ba-da. Now you got me to want to listen to the soundtrack now. Damn you, Phil Collins. Do what she do. Woo, woo. All right, so here's the scoop for the next episodes of Cinema Royale. It's a little, gonna be a little different than previous years. Yes, next month, February, we're celebrating our two-year anniversary. Two years doing this podcast straight, no breaks, no stops, just a miracle. Cause I never done that before. So, kudos for me and everybody else working on the podcast. Um, so we're gonna talk about our favorite films for that particular episode because you, you want to get to know us a little bit better and plus it's a it's a free form episode where we talk about our favorite films that we've not talked about on the podcast before not a strict you know topic rule you know it's gotta be a certain genre so it's kind of fun then we take a month off because two weeks from that we're gonna watch the oscars and actually do a reaction to it the uh, March 8th, because last year we uh, did a Oscars reaction, and Matt and I did well, that. Well, it was, yeah, it was just you and me, though. So. Yeah, so it was kind of, it was kind of quiet. It was kind of like everybody else was kind of busy that day. I was like, yeah, sure, we'll just do this, knock it out of the park. I figured we could make it a tradition on the podcast. This year should be actually pretty interesting for the Oscars, actually. Especially uh, Neil Patrick Harris hosting. Oh, he is? Yep. Yeah. He's, he's finally hosting the Oscars. All right, Dougie Hauser. Other than that, this has been uh, Cinema Royale, and we'll see you in the next episode. See you later, dudes. Ciao for now. <laughs>